Hi, welcome to the webinar for the Early Care and Education Action Plan from the Office of Early Childhood. We've just been giving people a few minutes to log in and it um, looks like we're up to about 76 people, so I think we're going to get started. Um, my name is Mary Farnsworth. I'm the Director of Strategy for the Office of Early Childhood, and we are uh, thrilled to have this conversation with you this afternoon about our, um, our action plan. Uh, I'll start with a few housekeeping notes, um, and then we will um, in introduce our presenters for this afternoon. So everyone is muted automatically, so don't worry about um, making noise on your end. We, no one will be able to hear it. You can't accidentally unmute yourself. We do look forward to your contributions either in um, uh, questions or comments, um, which you can contribute. Um, uh, which you can contribute via um, the chat box, which is on the right-hand side of your screen probably, and we'll be monitoring that for questions and taking a pause throughout the um, presentation for your questions and comments. So today we are joined with um, by Christine Johnston Staub, who is a national thought leader in the early care and education space at the Center for Law and Social Policy class, who's been helping to facilitate our public engagement sessions throughout this winter and um, and really helping to contribute to make this a, a fantastic plan. She'll be joining us for part portion of the presentation, um, and the other portion of the presentation is gonna be done by our commissioner, David Wilkinson. Um, and so I think at this point, I will um, hand it over in, uh, to Dave, so to Commissioner Wilkinson. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Mary. Uh, thanks to all of you who are on the phone today. Uh, it's really meaningful. Uh, to us to know that there are so many uh, who care so deeply about uh, young children in, family, in Connecticut and families with young children uh, and uh, that you want to know what actions uh, we plan to take. Uh, many of you are providers, uh, your advocates, your uh, parents, your voices in the community uh, and you really care. And um, and we'd be nowhere without you. And what we are going to be presenting on today uh, is uh, a series of actions, a comprehensive action plan that is deeply informed by your feedback. Uh, and so I think by way of you know, preamble, uh, if there was one mandate uh, that stood above the others um, when the Office of Early Childhood was created, a mandate in terms of its specificity and its clarity. Uh, it was to create a more coordinated, less fragmented early care and education system. One that achieves better results for children, that is more equitable, that is easier for parents to navigate, and one that reduces unnecessary burden on providers. Uh, and so, in my first month on the job, I committed to take a renewed, uh, comprehensive uh, action uh, on this vision for the Office of Early Childhood. And that, I should say, is only possible thanks to the hard work of my predecessors and everyone who's been at the Office of Early Childhood longer than I have, uh, to build an agency. This agency is a new one. It was an exciting and is an exciting vision to bring together fragmented early care and education and other early childhood programs from across agencies, bring them together to be more aligned. Um, at the same time, this agency is both a startup uh, and the result of a five-way merger from across agencies. And building uh, uh, a new enterprise like this has taken uh, time. So we're so grateful for everyone's patience. I was giving a speech about this uh, late summer, early fall um, at the uh, Early Childhood uh, Alliance meeting, and uh, the, the the chair uh, of the meeting uh, said, "You know, the Office of Early Childhood has achieved a lot uh, in its time, uh, in, in its existence. But much of what you have achieved, um, from a provider's perspective, are those things uh, that have added burden." Um, 
uh, you have not yet achieved a lot of the things we hoped you would do that would reduce provider burden and make it easier to focus on families. Uh, so I took that to heart. Uh, another thing I think that we've heard is no more listening tours. Um, and so uh, that's why we have had a series of action sessions. Uh, so why don't I share, for those of you who have perhaps not yet been part, one, part of one of the action sessions or of less visibility uh, to date to what we have been doing um, uh, to build our comprehensive action plan for early care and education. Um, I will note that uh, at our in December, um, I announced that we had brought together four years of feedback uh, that we have gotten uh, from the field. And Mary will uh, give you a, a, just a, a sense of that in a little bit. But we brought together four years of feedback um, uh, and, uh, and I announced that we would soon launch a new initiative to deliver on the early care and education vision for the Office of Early Childhood, and that this action process would start consistent with our mission to be transparent and responsive. Uh, it would start with a series of action sessions around the state to present and get feedback on the specific policy directions um, that we will be taking based on the feedback that we've gotten from you. Um, and I also announced uh, that in addition to that, um, that we would get to work right away on implementation, starting uh, with the legislative session. So our action sessions immediately abut abutted the legislative session. Um, we didn't want to wait a year, so we've gotten going on that. And you'll hear some about that uh, today uh, as well. So since that uh, December announcement, at, which took place at the Early Childhood Cabinet uh, with the Lieutenant Governor, um, the Office of Early Childhood has been moving full steam ahead on this commitment. Uh, and we are so far delivering on schedule. Uh, so we have barnstormed the state. Uh, we had action sessions uh, in uh, about three hour uh, public feedback meetings um, with multiple provider types, with advocates, with parents, with others, um, in Bridgeport, in Hartford, uh, in Ledger near New London, uh, and in Waterbury, different times of day to accommodate different schedules. Uh, where we presented the actions, the, the broad action areas we planned uh, to take. Uh, and that uh, additional feedback on our actions uh, helped us uh, get even more specific. And that's what you're about, you're about to hear today is um, the summary uh, of direction of, of where we're going. Um, and so we have developed and are advancing right now a series of legislative proposals uh, as well, um, and and so uh, that that will be one piece uh, of the puzzle. Uh, but I want everyone on this call to know that this for us goes far beyond legislation alone. Uh, in building this plan, everything is on the table, from legislation and statutes to regulations to policies and procedures to contracts and the way we and grant making and, and how we uh, implement those uh, all the way down to what someone on our team calls TAWADI, which is an acronym for the way we've always done it. Um, so uh, uh, with that, um, you know, I think I will now ask Mary Farnsworth uh, on our team, Office of Early Childhood team, who's already introduced herself, to give you a quick picture of uh, the work uh, that went into launching the action sessions. Uh, and I hope you'll see that it was very much uh, uh, to its core and in its DNA uh, informed by um, what we have been hearing as an agency uh, over the years from providers, advocates, and others. So, Mary. Thank you. So I'll just quickly sort of take you through the history of uh, feedback that we've been able to incorporate in this plan. So since our founding um, under Myra James Jones-Taylor, we have um, really been engaged in a lot of listening activities as we learn and we, and we chart our path forward um, as, an, as a new agency. And so I'll just highlight a few of the um, ways that we've been getting feedback that have contributed to this, and so you'll see there's really a, a a ground, 
uh, a real solid ground of feedback that we built this um, plan from. So over the last five years, we've had, and this is just my estimation, about over 400 community and provider meetings that our commis former Commissioner Myra Jones-Taylor conducted, or our current Commissioner Dave Wilkinson, um, our program managers, um, meeting with providers and families. Um, we have reviewed over 100 early childhood reports and plans, both at the local level and the statewide level, as well as some national plans as well, that, to really get a sense of what are people thirsty for, what are they intending to do, what are they hoping to do, uh, what are best practices. Uh, we distributed a number of surveys. Um, the latest one was a, a survey to providers about what their um, most important pain points were that was distributed to every provider in the Child Care 2 on 1 database um, this winter. Uh, we also conducted a family survey about what families were experiencing and what they wanted to see in their early care and education system. Um, that was a representative sample of families with young children in the state, um, representative both by um, the age of the child, the race of the family, as well as income. And that gave us a great um, portrait of, of what families were experiencing. We've had our, we've been advised by national S experts um, through our federal technical assistance um, providers, as well as Christine Johnson Staub, who's on the phone now from CLASP. Um, and then during the action sessions, which Dave has already described, we, uh, we incorporated over 200 additional written comments, as well as the ones that were um, incorporated um, verbally during the sessions um, to really hone our um, proposed actions to be responsive to what we were hearing from the field uh, on top of the data analysis that we had already conducted. Great. Thank you, Mary. And what I hope folks see is that we have endeavored to be uh, very thoughtful. Uh, there's, it's hard to think of something more important than our children's future. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure we were doing this smart, right, well, thoroughly, and in particular, uh, responsively uh, to those of you who are working on the ground every day um, with young children, uh, as well as, of course, advocates uh, and others. Um, and so uh, we are so excited now to get to present to you uh, what it is uh, that we plan to do. Uh, and so why don't we start by going to the next slide, uh, as you could hear from, from Mary from that process, as you might imagine, we had more than a few recommendations about what we might do. Um, some were very large and broad uh, sweeping with big implications, increase access, raise rates. Uh, others were incredibly specific, uh, uh, enable family child care providers to uh, have uh, higher ratios in the summer. Uh, so, um, uh, and everything uh, in between. Uh, so there was a lot there. We needed to find a way to take what were pages and pages of recommendations um, and put them into understandable buckets just to break it down, make it easier to communicate. Uh, so Maggie Adair on our team, I think, started with something like 14 pages of recommendations, and it only grew from there. And we looked. We worked with our partners at Third Sector, thanks to a federal social innovation fund grant we've gotten, and with Christine uh, Johnson Staub from uh, CLASP to build this into uh, a series of areas. Uh, there's not really a science to this. Uh, you'll see some recommendations that could theoretically fall in a different bucket. You might say you might not title it that way, but our goal here was simplicity uh, while capturing everything. And so the four buckets that we're using um, are licensing requirements and enforcement, access and rates, uh, workforce technical assistance and training, uh, and finally, uh, communication, information, and collaboration. And so um, I think what, what you'll see here on the next slide um, is a very top-line summary of where we were. So we're going to dive into more detail. Um, one thing that I should say, and for all of you to know, is that this is intended as a living document. We want to be, as an agency, radically transparent and radically responsive. Uh, that means, well, this is... Um, of course, deeply informed by your feedback, as you could see from Mary's presentation. Um, we want it to be continually informed 
by your feedback. Uh, what do you think of the actions that we're undertaking now? How would we, how do we prioritize these things? What questions do you have about? It? How can we make it clearer? Um, what have you, things can come up. So we're not going to be sticking dogmatically only to this. Uh, we are ready to, uh, be nimble even as we act uh, aggressively to pursue the following priorities. And so what you see here on this slide, and we're on slide three, um, uh, is uh, along the left side you see those same four categories of activity I named before. Uh, licensing, access and rates, workforce, TA, and communication and collaboration. Uh, and then uh, along the, on the right side, the bulk of the content there, uh, what you see is the high level objectives for each area. Uh, so this again is the top line overview um, and basically for each bullet that you see, um, what we are going to do, it's always good to create expectations, what we're going to do is for each bullet that you see there along the right, we're going to present an entire slide of actions and activities uh, that we intend to do. Um, so with these high level objectives, many of these things, none of these things are things that can be achieved overnight, but they are our North Star. And so we will be, uh, during this presentation, filling in the details behind each of these high-level objectives um, with the, pro the specific problems that, they, that we're intending to take on in pursuing these objectives, um, with the actions that we will be taking to address them, and with the detailed next steps that we are taking uh, now or in the near future to begin to address them. Um, and so I'll just quickly run through these items. Under licensing, um, uh, our high-level objective uh, is to improve implementation of our licensing program uh, and increase support to providers. Uh, and so uh, obviously we've gotten a lot of positive feedback that our licensing program has come a long way, but it remains one of the top items we, we hear about. I think it ranks fourth on on the list of priorities from the statewide survey. Um, so that is um, a real, uh, of course, area of interest. Uh, the next action area is access and rates. And so um, what you will see in the presentation to follow is that we will take action uh, on three high-level objectives, each of which will have its own slide, um, one set of actions on um, increasing our investment in infant and uh, uh, toddler care. Um, uh, another uh, second uh, slide was proposed with our planned actions are uh, to create a more coordinated statewide preschool system. Uh, and a third uh, on better supporting families uh, with special needs. Uh, so you will, much more detail to come on those, but those are the areas we're taking on within that action area. The next action area, workforce, technical assistance, and training. So there are two high-level objectives. Again, one represented on uh, one side, one on another. Um, uh, one is focused on increasing child care rates to ensure providers can afford to deliver high-quality care. And the next is simplifying and reducing um, duplicative or ineffective requirements for providers, areas like reporting, compliance, and, and possibly some overlapping quality uh, elements that we know we may be requiring. How do we smooth some of that out, streamline that, make it less burdensome for providers so they can focus more on kids? Uh, and finally, our last action area is communication, information, and collaboration. In that area, there are also two high-level objectives um, with action steps towards them uh, listed out on two slides. The first is about better serving families and listening to parent voice, uh, and the second is about uh, better, more transparent parent and continuous engagement um, with providers, advocates, and key stakeholders, uh, as well as um, better equipping uh, stakeholders of all types, providers, and everyone with next level data and facts about the impact that their work is having and that the early care and, ed and education field is having so that you can better tell the story. So uh, with that, uh, the next slide 
is a bit of a key, uh, if you will, uh, just so we're all on uh, the same page. This slide ha sort of has two purposes. One, uh, to just let you know, actions are underway, in particular in the legislative area, but also uh, uh, beyond. You'll see more of that. So you'll um, and and what this indicates is that items that you see as we go through that have green check boxes mean uh, that action is already started uh, with some progress made. Uh, there will be several areas with red diamonds. That means that it's a particular type of action that is underway, and that is um, uh, legislative, a legislative solution has already been put forward uh, or is under consideration by the legislature. Um, and so we wanted to specifically call out legislation, um, both because it is on a tight timeline uh, and we want to make sure folks are aware of it. And you will see as we go through also that not only does it have a red diamond, but it has the specific legislative uh, legislation number, bill number, uh, and relevant section to the area of action is in red text. You'll see that. And then finally, black dots uh, mean that action is planned, uh, but not yet significantly underway. Uh, wherever we do have target dates, um, we uh, you'll see those dates appear in blue. Uh, and I think one thing to uh, be aware of, of course, in terms of what's underway, what's not, is that if we attempted to do what you will see is a really robust um, series of actions, if we attempt to do them all at the same time, we wouldn't get very far. They wouldn't all fit through the funnel um, of our capacity. So uh, determining which ones we pursue in which order uh, is very important. We need to make sure we can bite, we bite off as much as we sh can, uh, log wins, achieve progress, and then move on to the next ones. We want to do that selection very transparently uh, and with you, and so you will see and we'll be very public about what we're taking on and when. Uh, and we welcome feedback, not just on the elements, but also the order and cadence in which we are pursuing them. Uh, and so, uh, to level set and to understand why we are taking on the actions we are uh, before each action area um, is discussed. Uh, our partner uh, from CLASP, uh, Center for Law and Social Policy, Christine Johnson-Staub, uh, will summarize uh, the top line pain points that we are addressing. Uh, this data was uh, pulled together from you, uh, our provider and advocate community. Uh, and what we did was we summed it all up, we put it together. Christine was with us um, as we went around the state in the four action sessions, um, as well as, well, and then we presented them also to, to staff internally here, uh, but uh, so she was with us presenting this around the state and even some of what we heard during those sessions further informed uh, these slides. So we think it's really important uh, to level set, make sure we're all on the same page about what we're addressing before we dive in uh, to the actions that we'll take to address them. So with that, uh, Christine, you will see probably, I'm sure, on your slide, um, slide number five, uh, the first um, summary of uh, pain points and supporting facts. Christine, go ahead. Great. Thanks, Commissioner. I appreciate it. And thanks, Mary, and, and to the staff at OEC for including me in this process, which has just been great. Um, before I get started, I just want to very quickly say that it's just really a pleasure to work with a state that is taking such a proactive stance on trying to identify and address the real um, challenges within the system. I think none of the challenges that we are going to talk about today are really unique to Connecticut. Most states have many of these challenges. Um, but what is less common is for states to be so thoughtful about a process of um, really talking to the whole variety of stakeholders, getting a grip on what the real problems are, and then really trying to go after concrete solutions. So I appreciate and, and using research and best practices to do that. So I, I really appreciate being part of this. Um, so as Dave said, I'm going to just it, at each action area try to summarize what the identified pain points were and then what some of the evidence and, and research behind and data behind those pain points are so that, um, so that uh, it will give context for the, um, for the next steps and for the action steps. Um, so the first action area is licensing requirements and enforcement, as the, as the Commissioner said, and the pain points identified in this area 
are, um, as you can see uh, at the top of the slide, are that OEC licensing regulations have been out of date, um, that licensing specialists don't consistently provide compliance feedback in a manner that providers feel supported. Um, so, you know, whether providers receive consistent feedback um, from different licensors, whether they felt like they were being supported in the process of addressing licensing concerns, um, and that families are using unsafe care and infants are at a higher risk for harm because of that. So some of the supporting facts that came from you and other stakeholders in identifying these pain points are um, that there are duplicate channels of monitoring occurring in silos, so different agencies um, requiring the same information or different offices requiring the same information, and that's a burden. Um, so, for example, reporting lead tests to multiple agencies. Also, that OEC licensing specialists are not consistent in their feedback regarding compliance, which was ranked number four out of the top ten issues that were identified by providers in the 211 child care survey that Mary mentioned a few slides ago. And then, since March 2016, there have been six recorded infant and toddler deaths in technically illegal or unlicensed childcare. So obviously that's a concern and getting to an action step that will help address um, children being in those settings is really urgent. Um, so those are the, that's the summary of the identified pain points in this area and the supporting facts. And I'm gonna turn it back to the commissioner to talk about what the next steps and action steps are in this area. Great, thank you so much, Christine. Um, and while I'm thinking of it, I, I not only want to thank you, it's great to have a national partner, partner, a national leader helping us think through this, but also to do so independently. So we're grateful to the Early Childhood Funder Collaborative, uh, which um, was helpful in, in bringing, bringing in ECFC. Um, so, uh, or bringing in class. So um, the, uh, this is our first slide, action slide, uh, and so I'm going to use this um, first to sort of orient you, because all the slides you will see to follow will follow this format. So here's the, for, um, the orientation uh, to this. You will see at the top uh, in big bold letters the action area that we're in. Uh, the top left is a reiteration of the pain points uh, that were identified. Um, uh, the, and in this case that Christine just, I, uh, just uh, went over. I think there may be someone who needs to put their phone on mute. But maybe that's Christine, because you may be the only one, Christine, who can communicate with us. Uh, it might be me. No, I was on mute. <laughs> You're, oh, you were on mute? Okay, there's some background noise, so someone is able to be heard <laughs> um, in the background. Um, so if you think you might be that person, we think you shouldn't. Uh, if you're, I'm, we're still hearing some background noise. Um, let's see. Everyone should watch. Yeah, still hearing things. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. All right, that might be good. Um, okay, so we'll try um, uh, to, I think this is working now. So uh, uh, without further ado, let's, let's jump in. So the format of these slides is at the top left, you will see the pain points um, along the left side of uh, the um, top left of the of the screen. At the right, you'll see the high-level objective that I discussed before for this action area. Uh, then below that, you will see our proposed actions. These are things we are, um, are so this is the top line summary that we're taking on now uh, in terms of the actions themselves. And then the bulk of the screen, the bottom right, um, is the specific next steps that we are taking, some of which are underway. Uh, and so uh, why don't I first dive in uh, then now, uh, you've, you've heard Christine summarize the pain points, you heard me talk about our high level objective which is to improve implementation of licensing of our licensing program and to increase support to providers uh, to achieve compliance. And the proposed actions that we are um, uh, taking uh, and 
to respond uh, and to take steps towards this high-level objective is, one, uh, to revise our licensing regulations and statutes to improve their clarity um, and to support high-quality practice. Uh, and the next steps we're to taking, as these are already underway, uh, one is to gather final suggestions on changes to the licensing regulations. Um, and we want to do that by May. Uh, so you can see that. I told you before that it's underlined. It's actually, I mean, it's blue. The dates are actually underlined. They are not, uh, wherever we have a date, they'll be underlined, not in blue text. Um, and so, uh, we um, will be gathering last feedback uh, by May. Uh, we'll be then drafting the final proposed regulations and then launching the formal regulatory process. Um, it's, it's worth noting that uh, you know regulations only get changed rarely. Um, they may we may be living with these regulations for as much as a decade, and so it's very important uh, to me as a commissioner, to us as an agency, to make sure we have the most up to date feedback from you. Um, and so. We have a draft form of regulations already in place, uh, but what we submit as draft, uh, you as the public will only be able to comment on those things that are included. So if something is excluded, there's not an opportunity to comment. That's why we're doing one last sweep to make sure we catch every topic area possible um, before this goes in for the formal regulatory revision process. Uh, but the regs aren't the other only uh, thing we're doing. We've also, for instance, one common request that we heard through the action sessions and feedback from family child care providers was the ability to care for additional children during the summer months. Uh, family child care providers can all already do so after school, um, and uh, there is not that option in the summer months. So we have legislation uh, 5169, Section 4, um, that uh, would allow um, uh, more children, I believe up to three additional children uh, when a family child care provider brings in an assistant. Um, so uh, we're excited about that. That bill ha is, has moved through committee and we, we hope it goes goes through, of course. Um, so that is the first uh, action item and next step, our regs uh, in particular being the biggest item there. Um, and uh, if that first action, it was about the regs themselves, the second uh, area of action is about is how we go about enforcing them. Uh, so the next action area is improve licensing practices with a focus on enhancing our support to providers to achieve compliance. We know that there's a power dynamic when a, a licensing inspector walks into a, a child care setting. Uh, and um, I've talked with my director of licensing, Deb Johnson, uh, who's very much on board with the principle of uh, when doing so, we need to go in there, uh, go into settings uh, more with the attitude of coaches than judges. Uh, and so um, we're working on that. It's, uh, it's challenging in part because of how the regulations are written. Um, and so while in addition to working on that, we're going to uh, look at how we can um, uh, increase support to help providers achieve uh, compliance without uh, seeming as punitive. Uh, to increase our consistency, we've got a lot of feedback about consistency, as Christine mentioned, and to minimize burden while max on providers while maximizing safety. And so the Office of the Child Advocate has agreed to co-convene with us um, an independent work group um, to improve the Office of Early Childhood's approach to uh, inspection. Uh, our focus will be on communications, training, differential monitoring, um, complaint processes, um, supporting uh, uh, organizations, uh, uh, centers, others uh, to be in compliance and logistics. And so we're excited about uh, soon launching that uh, with the Office of Child Advocate. Uh, we'll also be launching online licensure renewals. Uh, and so the final area um, in licensing uh, and enforcement um, is to reduce the use of unsafe care for infants. 
while in every state in the country there are complexities in the nature of the relationship between licensing inspectors and providers, we can never forget the vitally essential work uh, that our licensing inspectors do and sometimes, uh, and that our licensing regulations and, and um, uh, laws do. And sometimes it really is a matter of life and death since I have become commissioner. Four children uh, have died, all of them infants, uh, and all of them uh, in uh, unlicensed, uh, unregulated environments beyond the reach of the Office of Early Childhood. Uh, and, and as Christine said, dating back to before um, uh, my start, there were there were some some others recently as well. Uh, we take this, of course, very seriously. Uh, so, in response to that, our immediate next steps are that we are launching a communications campaign by June uh, to reduce infant deaths by increasing the use of safe legal care by parents, helping parents to understand the importance of um, uh, using a licensed uh, provider um, uh, to increase parents' use of legal care. Uh, another area uh, is uh, we are officially enacting uh, a no more blankets policy. Uh, we have gotten a lot of feedback that our policy is unclear. Um, we know that um, uh, you know, you know what is it, what are enough holes in a blanket to make it non-gas, uh, make it gas permeable? Um, that is up to uh, a lot of interpretation. Uh, no blankets is clear. Uh, it is also um, in line with uh, the American Society of Pediatrics. Um, recommended standards uh, of the deaths that we have seen in care in Connecticut. Um, either regulated over over the past history or more recently the uptick we have seen, um, many of them are potentially attributable and perhaps most likely attributable to SIDS. Uh, and we know that blanket use is a key factor there. Uh, so in addition to enacting that no more blankets uh, policy, which will be distributed very soon, um, officially, uh, though we recommend that you go ahead and start now. Um, we will be distributing sleep sacks to support compliance. Uh, so we're excited about that. This is in the category of a major announcement. Um, we understand, of course, that this comes perhaps with some challenge to some provider, so we want to make sure that we support you in doing it, uh, but we like the idea of clarity and we know that matters to you as well. Um, and anything we can do uh, to uh, prevent these types of tragedies, we absolutely are uh, going to prioritize. This is one such action. Uh, the third area, uh, next step, is that we, are, we will launch an outreach campaign to increase enrollment of infants and toddlers in care for kids uh, by May. We need Parent, we've gotten feedback that parents still don't know that Care for Kids is open again. Uh, so we are going to do a, a robust and culturally sensitive outreach campaign uh, to um, help folks, help moms and parents and caregivers know uh, that, ca that Care for Kids is open and, and taking new families. Uh, and the uh, last item, actually, that's not on here, uh, is that we're also, as part of some uh, some grants we're releasing, we're releasing a new grant uh, that will test efforts to recruit more licensed uh, providers, particularly, particularly, for instance, those who may currently be providing um, uh, care that is unregulated. Um, so we would want people to convert the care they're providing into legal care so they can enjoy some of the safety supports and other things that we provide. Uh, and uh, now I will hand uh, the mic over to Mary. Great. So we'll just take a moment to pause. If anybody's having trouble seeing the slides, um, please do reach out. I sent out a note. Please do reach out to Kyle Pylon, um, who can send you the PDF of the slides. But after every section, we're also going to take a moment to respond to any questions that have come up. And so I know everyone's on mute, but there's a chat box on the right-hand side if you're able to type in there any comments or questions. Um, we'll try and take a few each section and we will respond to the rest um, 
afterwards in, in written format if we're not able to get to them all. So we've had one question so far come in on this area, um, which is how do I join the licensing inspections work group? Um, we will be following up um, to the entire field, but also to this group um, who had registered for the webinar with a survey um, that includes questions about if you're interested, are you interested in joining any one of the work groups that we'll be talking about today? So we'll be capturing uh, suggestions um, for work group participants and going through a, a process to be, to be sure that the work groups are um, balanced in terms of um, provider type and families and provider and families versus providers and uh, racially and culturally balanced as well. So, um, but we encourage you to put your name forward if you're interested. Any other questions? I don't haven't seen any other questions come in on this topic, but on the next slide, feel free to send in your questions at any time, and then at the end of the section, we'll be answering them. So we'll move on to the um, next action area around access and rates with Christine. Okay, so in, um, under access and rates, there were three key pain points identified by stakeholders. Um, first, that there's not enough funding to provide affordable infant and toddler care in the state. Um, second, that state funding for preschool is disjointed, which results in uneven access among families, even those with similar circumstances of need. And third, that some families, particularly children with special needs, teen parents, shift workers, um, other families that face particular barriers are not getting the support that they need to be able to access high quality care. Um, so the the background around those particular pain points, I think, you know, comes from stakeholders and research. And I think everyone is, is very familiar with the research that says that 80% of brain development happens in the first three years and that the conditions in which that happens matter greatly. So this is obviously um, something that has to be addressed to, for children to have access to the type of care that's going to support brain development. Um, that there's a 10-year low in care for kids enrollment, which disproportionately impacts infant and toddler care. Again, not unique to Connecticut. It's been a 10-year low nationally for access to child care subsidies um, and in funding and until the recent increase in funding and that there is a gap of 31,000 infant and toddler spaces for financial assistance to families um, to help them pay for infant and toddler care. In other words, 80% of families who have infants and toddlers can't afford care if you look, if you consider affordability at a 10% at a of income uh, benchmark. Only 6% of black families and Hispanic families can afford infant and toddler care without financial assistance. And 40% of providers reported funding was a major barrier to enrolling children who are living in poverty, who are homeless, who are involved with DCF, um, who are, whose families are survivors of domestic abuse or who have developmental delays um, or are the children of teen parents. So in other words, children who um, or experience these particularly challenging circumstances, the providers need more funding to be able to address um, the barriers that those families face and that those children face, um, and th that they're not able to, um, to provide the comprehensive um, services that are needed by those families in April uh, under the current uh, payment rates. Um, and I think that is that sums up that, so I will turn it back over to the commissioner. Great. Thank you so much, Christine, um, uh, for reviewing those pain points that we heard from the field um, and are very strongly backed up with data. And moving on to slide eight. So what are we going to do about those problems? Um, so the first action, uh, the first challenge uh, we are taking on in the area of access and rates uh, is uh, this particular pain point, that there's not enough funding uh, to provide affordable infant and toddler care in the state. As Christine said, this is a national challenge. Uh, there has been a lot of increased in interest uh, among um, national level advocates, philanthropy, think tanks, and others. And yet, there is still no playbook 
for a state to do uh, to take this on. And that in part is because it's hard. So we're going to be inventing the playbook ourselves in Connecticut. Uh, and um, we are going to be doing it in a way that's really prudent um, and responsive to uh, the field of providers. Um, our um, principle here is that if we want to create positive change, it must be and can only be done um, uh, consistent with having uh, a stable infrastructure uh, of providers. And so we want to make sure anything we do does not destabilize the provider community. So uh, with that said, uh, we seek uh, infant toddler care um, is, as I mentioned, our top priority uh, this year. It's our biggest priority, whether it's through our legislative proposals, um, of course, these uh, the actions we're taking here beyond legislative proposals, or our broader mission as an agency, our top priority is improving access to care for infants and toddlers. Uh, we've seen the stark and uh, tragic results uh, when we don't do so. Uh, and um, this, of course, is the population for which there is the greatest unmet need and the most important time of life for the provision of safe and stable and quality care. Christine mentioned the tremendous uh, brain development that happens in the first year of life, and we know the conditions are very important in which those, that takes place. Um, and high-quality early care and education uh, is a critical factor in a young child's and infants and toddlers healthy social uh, and emotional development. Uh, we also know the early months and years are a time when working parents are most in need of support and least likely to get it. Um, and we know that without access to safe, licensed care, parents find themselves forced to choose unregulated, unlicensed, and sometimes unsafe alternatives. Uh, so for these reasons, and others will do all we can to responsibly increase family access to affordable infant and toddler care. Um, and uh, we want to make sure we have as many uh, of the tools at, at, at possible, as, um, as possible at our disposal to do so. Um, and so the changes that we propose in legislation, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, in combination with our existing authorities will give us the tools we need to do that in a way that supports providers without creating undue challenges. Uh, and so, um, uh, as you can see there, the high-level objective is to balance investments between infant and toddler and preschool care uh, to build a foundation for zero to five care uh, and educate uh, in our system. Uh, and so our first uh, action uh, is, um, is to implement a steady, responsible approach to transforming the funding system uh, with an eye to maximizing impact, infant toddler support, and provider stability. Um, we're very aware, of course, of the challenge economics of high quality infant toddler care. Uh, just thinking of the a typical ratio in the K through 12 system, maybe one teacher to 20 or 25 students. In infant toddler, it's one to four. Uh, that means there's less room uh, uh, for, for movement, and that's why I talk about the importance of being sensitive uh, and, and taking steps prudently. Um, but we, we also have seen uh, what happens. Already the most underserved populations, when care for kids closed, um, we had this tremendous reduction, over 40% reduction in infant toddler care, and uh, Christine referred to um, uh, referred to that uh, as well. Um, and that means parents or the children are born onto a wait list uh, in the most critical years of life. Uh, so critically, um, uh, our next steps are to plan for increased investment in infant toddler care across the system uh, by making adjustments to existing policy. Um, and so uh, a big piece of that is our legislation. Uh, so as we contemplated how we'd follow through on our action session commitment uh, to streamline and enable the early care and education system and to do so consistent with our top priority of better serving infants and toddlers, families with infants and toddlers, we realized that our toolkit had some tools missing. Um, so if, if anyone has looked at our legislative proposal, it may, be, may appear to be a series of disconnected proposals. Um, the new uh, legislative uh, requests we have um, together uh, with our existing authorities will enable us uh, to better deliver um, 
in on the Office of Early Childhood uh, vision overall of a better integrated system that better serves infants and toddlers. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, just to point to the complexity of this, we also know uh, that uh, when uh, when we're, it, when, if any provider is even contemplating providing more infants and toddler care, uh, that can often mean actual changes to physical space. Uh, so another area, next step action is to identify ways to support infrastructure development funding to help the field increase infant toddler capacity uh, in terms of in, in terms of your space. We know a, a ten to one ratio uh, preschool room is is different physically uh, than a, a four to one ratio infant toddler room. Um, and uh, the, th the third area of action is to increase our coordination between the early care and education system and the Office of Early Childhood's infant toddler supports that we have elsewhere in our agency, including birth to three, our child, uh, childhood development info line, and our home visiting systems. So we want to better support early care and education providers through our other programs. That what, that's what that next step is about. Um, the next area of proposed actions uh, is to take um, first steps to support and enable providers to enroll and serve infants and toddlers. So if the above was about systems, this is more about some of this, uh, some of the specifics so the other, uh, rather than systems and infrastructure. So uh, one, um, and this is uh, a big one, is increase the care for kids, infant and toddler rates. Care for kids is the primary way through which we support infant toddlers. We have one other program, CDCs, that, that, that do that, but Care for Kids by far is the largest in terms of scale, um, and we know the rates are too low. In particular, um, they are, are out of compliance with the federal mandate in the, in the context of center-based uh, child care. Uh, so we'll do that uh, to the extent possible uh, by July. Um, we are doing the math on that presently, um, doing the analysis now. Obviously, there are big implications when you make a rate change uh, depending on the scale, and so we're going to do what we can that's practical in the near term, um, even as we have longer term goals to improve that even more. Um, so that's uh, a key, key action item we know. Um, the next area is to make modifications to the next round of early care and education RFPs, contracts, grants, federal award applications such as uh, Child Care Development Funds, uh, CBCAP, these are applications the Office of Early Childhood makes to the federal government uh, and do so to do so to increase slots rates supports and incentives uh, for infants and toddlers both uh, again within the contracts that we're putting out to the field as well as the applications that we're making um, so that's going to be infants and toddler support is going to be a key priority there um, and so more of you will be be seeing that we're working out what that might look like, and of course we're going to want feedback uh, before we launch anything formal. Um, the next area is uh, legislation. Uh, so we um, have in introduced policy changes um, to uh, help providers serve infant and toddlers. Um, so beyond rates, which may be, you know, the most important, um, uh, we are, for instance. Uh, have a proposal that would allow us to adjust the wait list rules within Care for Kids to ensure that infants and toddlers are not disproportionately harmed uh, when there's a Care for Kids wait list. Again, we uh, we know that our infants and toddlers are the most fragile and that their parents need the most support, and yet they're the ones who are the f uh, most likely to find themselves uh, stuck at the back of the wait list, uh, and they shouldn't start there. Uh, so uh, we're getting new authority, we hope, through our most important piece of legislation, 5449. Um, let me repeat that again, section, or uh, bill number 5449, which is going to be before the uh, Finance Committee, uh, we hope, uh, tomorrow. It's been referred to the Finance Committee. Um, so it introduces a number of specific tools in our toolkit, um, including that one and others, uh, to better serve infants and toddlers um, while keeping providers whole. Uh, so we think that's important to do. Um, and the third item uh, that is underway is that we know that family child care providers um, are a major source of the provision and key source of the provision of infant toddler uh, care. Uh, and so uh, we also know that family child care providers can often be isolated. There's lots of 
uh, technical compliance back end business activities that they have to do. They all have to have their own, they have to do accounting and reporting and all of this. And so we will, uh, we're, we have announced that we are strengthening the family child care system through shared services networks uh, that will reduce the administrative costs and increase stability for providers. Uh, we're really excited about this. So the, the announcements will be coming soon, uh, but we're going to be building better supports that will allows family care providers do more of uh, why they got in the business in the first place, which is to care for kids in a great, supportive, safe, high-quality way, uh, and spend less time doing spreadsheets, uh, reporting, and other back-end activity, and to better support them um, with uh, the technical assistance that they need and help them be better connected to one another, because we know it can be an isolating job. So um, we're excited about that action area. Um, now I'm going to move ahead uh, to uh, the second uh, problem that we are taking on within the action area of access and rates. I want to remind folks that you can ask questions about any of these um, uh, any of these uh, proposed actions or anything else, anything that's missing, uh, we will be taking them at the end of this section. So, for, for instance, in this section, uh, as you'll recall, we have three different high-level objectives, so we have slides on those, and once before we enter the next section, we'll answer any questions on this area. Um, so, uh, this is the second of three um, action areas in the area of access and rates. Uh, the pain point, again, is that um, state funding for preschool is disjointed, um, resulting in uneven access among families with similar circumstances of need. Um, and our high-level objective is to create a coordinated statewide preschool system. Obviously, that's a long-term goal, but we want to take more meaningful steps more quickly towards that. Um, as I mentioned, uh, before, we're called upon uh, to build a more aligned early care and education system overall. Um, and given that we are called on to do that, um, then we know that pre-K is the area where we have the most misalignment. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense to focus on that. We have seven different programs with slightly different goals. Some of you who are providers may be reporting on uh, several of these different programs and uh, that, that you're receiving. Um, and so uh, these were bills that you know were passed at different times, different focuses, et cetera. How can we align them to make it easier for providers and parents as well? Uh, so uh, our proposed action is to better align and distribute preschool funding, administration, and policies across multiple provider types and funding streams. We want to keep the best of what's working uh, and um, reduce those things that are redundant, not working, too complex, uh, and disjointed. Uh, that means making requirements more similar. Um, and so uh, we have two legislative items here. Um, so one is to work with legislators to build multiple needed structural changes into the early care and education legislation uh, to enable the development of a more coordinated system, as we have been called on to do from the founding of this agency. Um, I think uh, you, will, you, will, you will see, and we'll, and we'll get to this uh, later, but among them we are recommending that we lift the legislatively mandated school readiness rate cap, uh, for instance, and there's a number of others. Another legislative um, item uh, is to embed practical changes and incentives in the next round of early care and education RFPs, contracts, grants, federal award applications uh, to create a more coordinated preschool system uh, for Connecticut. And they're within our most important bill, 5449. There are a couple sections that will help us do that, as well as in our other important bill, 5169, um, uh, section 5. So. Uh, a number of um, relatively m modest or medium-sized uh, legislative authorities uh, in combination with our existing toolkit will help us uh, do more uh, on that front. Um, and uh, the, uh, the next area is that we also, not only providers are navigating kind of a fragmented uh, series of programs that we implement as an agency, but parents must navigate as well. And what's most complex for them and most relevant for, for them is care for kids, of course. Uh, so we're convening a working group uh, to, to assess and improve family experience 
uh, in applying for and using care for kids. In particular, to streamline enrollment and to reduce false rejections. Uh, and we'll be convening that by August, if not sooner. Uh, so we're really enthusiastic about, about that. Um, and then uh, I will move on to the final area. We're on slide 10 uh, for those who are coming along, uh, uh, who, are, who are following along on paper, um, slide 10. Um, so uh, this is the third and final uh, sort of uh, slide in this area. So the third uh, challenge we are taking on uh, in the action area of access and rates uh, is that some families, uh, children with special needs, teen parents, shift workers, um, English uh, as a second language, families, etc., are not getting the support they need. So our high-level objective uh, is to address the need, uh, needs of all families with young children, including those uh, with distinct needs. Uh, and the first proposed action uh, is to reduce the barriers to care for children with disabilities uh, or special education needs. Uh, and so uh, we'll do that uh, by uh, assessing and addressing the exclusion of children with developmental delays, disabilities, and children with special health care needs from child care. This is something we got a lot of feedback on. Um, you know, we asked for feedback not only from providers and, uh, and advocates, but also parents, uh, and, and including parents with children with special needs, as well as our systems that engage with early care and education, like birth to three and home visitors who see families' needs from a, from a different angle. Uh, and so we uh, will be producing clear guidance on the rights of um, uh, of parents uh, to help them understand their rights. Um, but we also uh, recognize that this is costly for providers and that providers need to be offered more support um, to be able to um, uh, provide care for special need children. Uh, and so we'll support providers through program uh, rate and eligibility changes and infrastructure changes and uh, training and consultation uh, support for those families, uh, children with special needs. Uh, another area um, uh, that we're very excited about uh, that is already beginning and is underway um, with our child care development info line is uh, we recognize, everyone recognizes now the undeniable brain science and the importance of identifying children with developmental delay early. A developmental delay that goes on three or four months unidentified for a, a, a child below the age of 18 months can literally change the trajectory of their lives, their likelihood of entering special education, uh, therefore they're likely to drop out, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we need better ways um, to surface developmental delays and channel families to appropriate supports. So we're very excited uh, to s hopefully soon be launching a pilot uh, that gets uh, easier to use app in people's hands, uh, parents' hands, to do um, ASQ. We know most low-income families in particular don't get their internet at home. They are accessing it over phones. Uh, ASQs are mostly uh, now pretty much exclusively um, performed uh, either uh, at home-based computers uh, and or through a paper mailing system, mail back uh, system. And so we know uh, implementation uh, is quite low, maybe down around 17% in terms of full completion. Uh, so we need to make this easier for families and we want to work with providers as well uh, on that uh, front and empower them with this app as well. So more to come on that front. And the last area that's already under way is to review and modify our B06 um, school readiness policy to allow children to attend special education hours at public schools uh, without penalty. Uh, this is something that we heard about in every single action session around the state, uh, and so we are going to be taking this on and we're going to want your feedback on it, and that process is already underway. Um, the next proposed action 
um, is to monitor and address disparities in access and outcomes. So we'll be communicating the value of early care and education investments, particularly economic impacts uh, for all children. Um, and uh, that type of communication and the value of support for families with, with these types of needs is really important because it has long-term implications for the costs to the state and other systems, whether it be child welfare, uh, DEMAS, or others. Uh, and we'll also take action to increase equity and access and outcomes for families. Um, and uh, this has to do with better, providing better support, uh, addressing our statewide efforts to prevent and address trauma. When we address trauma in advance, we better uh, support uh, uh, providers who may be dealing with disruptive behaviors. Uh, so we're going to be taking more steps on those uh, types of activities, um, and, uh, and trauma will be a big priority as part of our big 2Gen initiative as well. Uh, we just did a statewide event, announced nine new commitments to action, a couple from Office of Early Childhood, another from DCF, and, and others from private providers. So more to come there, and all have implica impl implications for the early care and education system. Uh, and so this one particular action area actually goes on to a second slide, so it's the same pain point, um, but uh, we just need a little more room for this one. So um, the third proposed action and, uh, is to enhance the capacity of early care and education system to serve families with additional needs. Um, and so uh, here uh, on this front, so we may be, for instance, talking about English as um, a second language uh, families or families that have uh, maybe experiencing homeless. So um, one uh, key next step is to establish partnerships with peer agencies to connect the early care and education system to statewide resources to prevent and respond to trauma. So this kind of expands the two. Um, uh, there are crosses across the two slides. Uh, so home visiting and maternal uh, uh, depression supports, supporting uh, providers to help children with behavioral concerns, similar or, or expansion of our ECCP program, our ECE, our uh, early care education-based screening, referral and support, homelessness diversion, um, and supports to incarcerated parents and substance-using parents, among others. So you'll see some specific, where we know there are specific high-challenge problems, uh, we'll be looking to enhance the capacity and support to the ECE system to address those. Um, among other key priorities uh, in legislation, um, uh, we've embedded in, uh, in language in the early care and education grants, contracts, and applications, uh, policies, and regulations uh, to incentivize the enrollments with of families with additional stressors. For example, um, so if the last one was about developmental delays, this is more about rewarding uh, multilingual uh, early care and education providers with RFP points, um, introducing additional bonus payments, uh, modify eligibility rules. Uh, and incentivize community partnerships um, and invest in proactive outreach um, uh, for those families who have additional stre uh, stressors. Again, if the last one was about developmental delays and uh, uh, health challenges, this is those other stressors. We want to provide support there. Um, another item that's underway is provide training and resources uh, that in a way that is accessible and translated for all providers uh, to best serve children, families, especially those with uh, additional stressors in family child care. So we need to translate everything. That's a big piece of it. And the last, uh, there's a piece of legislation, um, 5169 sections 1 and 2, we're seeking to remove barriers to enrolling uh, in child care for children who are experiencing homelessness. Um, that's something uh, that has been a big priority of the Early Childhood Cabinet and is of our agency and as well as the federal funders of Care for Kids, the federal government. Um, typically uh, in Connecticut, uh, um, family can enroll or mom can enroll children without a physical and immunization records. Of course, if you're recently homeless, it can be incredibly challenging to access that paperwork. Uh, so our legislation would provide a 90-day grace period, recognizing how hard that is. And, um, uh, you know, we don't want uh, a three-year-old sitting on a cot in a homeless shelter when they could be in a rich, rewarding environment that so many of you on the phone uh, provide. 
Okay, uh, so now we have covered two of the four action areas. We have talked about licensing and regulation, we've talked about access and rates. Uh, before we go on to the next one, uh, I am going to hand this back over to Mary um, to address uh, or to see if we have any questions. Great, thank you. So we did get a, a lot of questions. I'll try and answer as many as I can in the, uh, without delaying us further. The, um, the, one of the questions that came in is, uh, will the Family Child Care Network support CACFP, the food program? Um, will they support providers with those guidelines? That is a great suggestion that um, I'm sure we can consider as we're putting together those contracts. Dave's going to weigh in. Thank you for that. Um, that's a great question. We have from some of the respondents seen specific recommendations around CACFP. Um, we haven't made our final announcements yet, but there were some competitive um, uh, proposals that were interested in better supporting family child care pr providers in this area. So please stay tuned for what will hopefully be a positive announcement on that front. Great. There were also a few questions that came in about the legislation, how to get more information about it, how to get more details about it. Um, in the follow-up from this, um, we will be sending out um, information about those uh, legislative um, bills that are, that are before the legislature right now, and there was a suggestion to put in links. That's a great suggestion. We'll do that. Um, another question that came in was how do we get um, – would you consider changing birth to three to birth to five when we're talking about our developmental um, delay supports to families? Um, I know Dave's going to – oh, uh, I'll, I'll say a little bit about this, which is that it's a, a federal designation. Um, when we get the funding and the requirements from the feds, that those are not um, age brackets that we can change on our side of the fence, but that we can build better coordination between those age groups and are, and are working to do that. But uh, another great suggestion. Um, it's worth noting that while we have the federally funded and state funded birth to three system, uh, we do think on a birth to five basis as an agency, and this is part of kind of overcoming historical legacy um, delineations between zero and three and um, our fours and fives. Uh, but if you think about some of our programs that we support, uh, for instance, uh, ECCP that helps address behavioral issues in children, um, that's uh, relevant across the board. But I think this is, that's a, it's a great question, and um, we will be striving wherever we can with our authorities to think of it as more holistic across age groups. Great. Um, there was another question that came in about family child care providers um, asking about could we consider changing the number of infants under two um, to increase the ability for family child care providers to do that. I think that there's um, a few um, opportunities to weigh in on that. Certainly um, you're welcome to weigh in on our legislation that discusses that in part. And the other place to do that is during the um, regulations uh, feedback that we'll be conducting uh, shortly. And there was another question about how do we get involved in that? So we'll, in the notes and also um, distributed to all providers in the Child Care 201 database, the EC listserv or Facebook page, we'll be sharing it very broadly, will be links to the sur a survey um, describing, uh, giving you the opportunity to weigh in on what kind of regulatory changes you'd like to see in those licensing regulations, some of which do talk about ratios. Um, there were a few other questions that came in about bachelor's degrees and, um, and rates, and I think that they will be discussed in our next set of slides, so I'm just going to um, pause on those and feel free to ask another question um, if we don't cover them sufficiently. Thank you so much, Mary. And, you know, I'm interested in the question about family child care providers and the number of infants under two. Um, you know, this for us, we get a lot of really interesting advice that comes from the exact right place, but sometimes um, are conflicting. And this is the sort of thing, well, I'll give another uh, example. There's some um, who have made specific recommendations about changing the ratios, uh, for instance, overall. Uh, um, let's say in the infant toddler space, maybe make it one to five instead of one to four uh, because of the economics issue. And there's some genuinely, uh, and there's let's say the BA requirement, other things where um, you know there's conversations to be had, and we want we want to make sure that 
various stakeholders see that. I uh, really appreciate that. And um, also we're getting some good questions come in, so let's try to keep track of those too as, as people also weigh in on the sound quality. Um, uh, at any rate, we're going to pop, keep going, and next uh, is Christine uh, will talk about, um, the, will introduce the next action area and, and the pain points and the challenges we face in the area of workforce, technical assistance, and training. So again, we're moving on to the third of four areas of action. Christine, take it away. Okay. Um, I think we need to advance the slides. Right? Yes, thank you. Um, so we're going to talk about the next action area, which is workforce technical assistance and training, as the Commissioner said. And uh, the stakeholder input and discussion um, led to two particular identified pain points um, in this area. The first is not a big surprise, and we've already been talking about it a little bit, is that child care rates are inadequate to cover the full cost of high quality care for children ages birth to five, especially workforce costs, and workforce costs are the, you know, the major, um, the, make up the, the, the vast majority of costs under high quality child care. Um, and the second is that it's too hard for providers to comply with workforce qualification requirements and program funding requirements. So it's hard to find staff that meet the qualifications, it's hard to get staff to those qualifications, it's hard to meet the requirements of high quality care and looping back, particularly given um, the, that child care rates are inadequate to cover those full costs. So the, the supporting facts that go along with those two pain points and, and provide evidence of those two pain points um, the first is that the average operating cost to run a preschool classroom in a center is $328,000, of which 77% is driven by workforce costs, as I was saying before, um, which leaves not a lot of margin for everything else. Um, the second is that it costs approximately $24,409 per child per year to provide quality infant toddler care in the center, and that's a cost that neither families nor um, the system right now can actually bear. Third, it costs approximately $18,910 per child per year to provide quality preschool care in the center. And fourth, wages are too low to attract and retain highly qualified staff. That was ranked number three out of 10 issue areas that were identified by the providers surveyed in the 211 child care survey. So it rose you know, near the top of concerns um, among providers. And the system around workforce is complex. There are 15 steps in the career ladder and different staff requirements for school readiness, for quality rating and improvement system, for care for kids. So different systems have different requirements and they don't all align or meet up or um, in, you know, maybe, and it's too much to, uh, and too complex for providers to manage and to find the workforce that meet those qualifications. Um, so the bottom line in this, in this area is that uh, child care rates are inadequate to cover the full cost, so that there's an under-resourcing to providers, um, and that providers at the same time are grappling with very um, demanding workforce qualifications and program funding requirements, all of which are really good requirements and are there for a reason. Um, but which costs, which have significant costs, which then aren't covered um, by the wages that they're that that they're able to cover through the current rates. Um, so those are the uh, the pain points that stakeholders identified, and some additional background information on them. And I'll turn it back over to the commissioner to talk about action steps in this area. Thank you so much, Christine. Uh, as we go on to slide 13, I think it was a great summary. That, um, uh, this is an area that we heard a lot about, particularly from our provider community. Uh, and so uh, we're excited about the steps that we're taking on this front. Um, the first of two uh, broad challenges we seek to take on um, in, in this area, uh, as Christine uh, mentioned, that pain point in the top left, that child care rates are inadequate to cover the full cost of high quality care for children ages zero to five, especially the workforce costs. Now you might be asking yourself, well gosh, the last section was on access and rates, so why are rates coming up 
here? Uh, well, um, it's very intentional. Um, first of all, we know that rates matter. We hear about rates a lot. Um, but it's also intentional because uh, the notion that quality, uh, access, and rates are deeply interconnected and influence one another. Um, and so we need to be thinking about all of that uh, together when we raise, raise rates or we raise a quality requirement, that has an impact on access. If we increase access uh, um, and quality requirements without, or we increase quality access with um, quality requirements without rates um, increases, then it's an unfunded mandate. And so we as an agency need to recognize that in our laws, our regulations, our policies and standards, that if we demand quality from providers, then we need to pay for it uh, because it can't be done uh, uh, free or on the cheap. Uh, and so, um, our uh, and I, I will I will quote uh, my friend uh, Monette Ferguson. Uh, hi, Monette. I'm sure you're on the line. You referred to this earlier today. Uh, this call uh, from ABCD, uh, one of our largest providers in the state in Bridgeport. As she said, sometimes I feel like we've been set up to fail uh, with respect to the workforce requirements. Um, uh, because it can be hard to hold on uh, to folks, for instance, with BAs. So uh, our first uh, proposed action uh, is to make responsible, modest increases to school readiness, child daycare, early Head Start, and Head Start State supplement to replicate the best practices from the preschool development grant uh, to the extent possible uh, and to support quality uh, where, um, where finances, uh, uh, wherever finances allow. Uh, I previewed this earlier. Um, the, uh, the first item, you see legislation. This is a, a, a big deal one. We have introduced legislation to allow the Office of Early Childhood to raise school readiness rates. We do not have that authority right now. Uh, it's quite unusual. Only the legislature can increase those rates, which is quite a process, as anyone knows. Uh, so um, Section 5449, uh, or I'm Sorry, uh, Bill 549, House Bill 5449, Section 8, um, and uh, is is the provision that does that. This again uh, is a provision that has now been referred to the Finance Committee. We hope that it makes it through. It's in the Finance Committee, and we hope it makes it through. Um, we don't know if it will. The deadline is tomorrow, uh, 10 a.m. hearing that will be on this provision 5449. Um, the uh, so we know, of course, this is important because school readiness comes with significant quality standards that apply not only to the school readiness slot, but every single child in every single classroom in the entire uh, uh, center that is uh, accepting school readiness funding. Uh, and so we need to make sure we're covering the, the cost of quality to the extent possible. Um, so that's one thing that is underway. We hope it makes it through the Finance Committee um, uh, as part of 5449. Uh, the uh, next area is to communicate with stakeholders and the public about the connection between rates and wages and access and quality. Um, and for instance, comparison to uh, public elementary uh, school costs. Our costs are much lower. Um, and, uh, and we need to understand uh, that uh, I think it's a it's a positive it's a productive framing to show um, uh, the difference there to to build the will and understanding of the need to better fund quality, uh, and then uh, another area is to release uh, a rates analysis for child care spaces and propose a long term increase plan. We can't do everything overnight. We're going to need to take the steps where we can. Um, and so that uh, that rates analysis uh, will come out. Uh, the next proposed action is to increase care for kids rates. So we were talking about the other ECE uh, sort of slot-based system, of course, the voucher-based subsidy system of care for kids. Um, we want to increase care for kids rates towards meeting the federal benchmark of 75th percentile of market rates for all settings. After infant toddler uh, care for kids rate increases, which is for reasons I've said before, our top priority, we want to finalize a long-term care for kids rate increase plan for other age groups and provider types. Um, 
this again won't happen every night, I mean overnight, uh, but let's have a plan, a cadence. And we're encouraged uh, in the Care for Kids space, not only I've been uh, remiss in not, in not mentioning uh, that the federal government is providing additional funding thanks to Congress, um, and in part Rosa DeLauro, we just did a press event with her last week, um, in Connecticut will be getting 15 million more, uh, we expect, uh, for Care for Kids, and the legislature, uh, to her credit, um, uh, uh, Tony Walker has uh, pr proposed in one legislative budget plan another $5 million increase to Care for Kids, so that's uh, great and potentially helpful. Um, so that is the first slide, and now we're going to move to the second uh, slide, so um, the second of two challenges in this action area of workforce techno assistance and training uh, is that it's too hard for providers to comply with workforce qualification requirements and program funding requirements. Uh, so our high level objective here is to simplify and reduce duplicative or ineffective requirements for providers. So if the last slide was about doing what we can to dial up funding to cover the costs of quality, this slide is about dialing back the costs of delivering quality. Um, so ideally your revenue goes up and the cost of implementation goes down uh, and we make quality uh, performance uh, easier to do in the combination of those two sets of activities. So our, our actions are, one, um, to improve data systems and reduce redundancies in data collection. And the next steps there are to give programs access to information. Uh, one of the biggest areas in terms of, in terms of compliance on the safety side is of course, criminal justice background checks. Uh, so uh, we'll be giving uh, programs access to information about status of uh, criminal justice background checks through a new data system. We've had to negotiate this out in a detailed way with the state police and others, uh, but it's not okay that uh, you have to pay for a whole um, background check uh, and not be able to know whether or not the person actually has any kind of um, uh, background that would disqualify uh, them for a role, particularly this affects uh, centers. Um, we'll be taking some other actions on criminal background check costs and burdens as well. You have seen that we've already taken some actions that are complete um, in um, including making that background check portable so that workers can move across different uh, providers so you don't have to pay for background check every time they, uh, sh for instance, move from one center to the other. Um, and then uh, the next area is to uh, assess and improve existing data systems, um, registry, charts, or course, ECIS, online coursework systems, care for kids. Uh, we had uh uh, a senior Obama official uh, do a technical review. We've got some really good feedback on ECIS. We look forward to improving those systems and making them work better for providers. Uh, the next um, area uh, is to simplify the workforce requirements and reduce reporting burdens. So workforce requirements and reporting burdens. Um, so we will, uh, on the topic of reporting requirements, convene a work group to assess those reporting requirements and identify both near-term and long-term opportunities to streamline, simplify, uh, and reduce redundancy. Um, for example, uh, improvements to the registry, waivers to lab schools, CCDF training requirements, bachelor degree requirements are some of the redundancies. Uh, but in terms of reporting itself, we know even within the reporting uh, that there's redundancy. Uh, I recently visited a child care center in Torrington where I was painstakingly at my own um, agreement walk through all of the reporting that providers have to go through when they're a recipient of multiple different uh, subsidy types from the state. And it's a series of overlapping, slightly time differentiated um, and redundant reporting that we can make smoother. So again, you can spend more time doing your jobs and less time filling out paperwork for us. Uh, and so we will be taking the steps we can uh, there, both near term and some long term steps. Uh, working group. Anyone who wants to join that working group, uh, let us know. Email Kyle. Um, so uh, the uh, 
uh, so the next area, uh, the next green check box there, uh, or green check is something already underway, it's to complete our QRIS pilot and revise the system based on provider feedback. Uh, feed, your feedback for those uh, nearly 100 of you that are involved in a QRIS pilot is very important to us. Um, we, want to we want to have better alignment with our licensing, care for kids, school readiness, CDC, Head Start, NAPC, and NIAC requirements. Uh, so those things are aligned, not just a bunch of additional, hopefully a bunch of, uh, not a bunch of additional hoops, but aligned wherever possible. Um, and uh, the uh, next area is legislation. It will introduce legislation to reduce unnecessary regulatory burden on providers. And so our Bill 5169, which has been passed on to the floor, Sections 3, 4, and 7 have modest um, regulatory burden reduction for centers, for, uh, for family child care providers, and for uh, relative-based providers. So um, uh, we're, we're happy that that is move, hopefully going to move, uh, move on again get voted on by the House. Um, and then one of the things that we heard about the most in our action sessions um, uh, was around the workforce requirements. In particular, we hear about the bachelor's de degree requirement. Um, and that's getting back to Monette's uh, quote that I remember writing down when we were in Bridgeport, we're set up to fail. Uh, it is, we know that it can be hard uh, to recruit folks with bachelor's degree, degrees and, and still hard, harder still to maintain them over time. And uh, one thing we know is important for a child's experience is continuity of care. If you can't hold on, if you can't find or then hold on to people with bachelor's degrees, how much are we helping? Uh, and so, um, you know, I think what's important to note is that providers do not question the goal, the aspiration to professionalize the field. Um, but what they do question is their ability to achieve that under the current approach. Um, and so, the new legislation which we worked on with legislators um, uh, calls on us and we co-wrote this, but it calls on us uh, to undertake the most robust re-examination of the bachelor's degree requirement uh, we've ever done in the decade in the decade plus history of the requirement, uh, and in particular uh, to re-examine how we go about achieving that those laudable goals. Uh, so. Um, now, for uh, that is actually everything um, in in our short form uh, presentation, at least that we're doing on this front. And so um, uh, now we will be happy to take any uh, questions in the area of workforce technical assistance and training. Mary. So before we move on to our last section, as Dave said, um, I'll answer as many as I can in the next let's say five minutes to try and get through. Um, so there's a question about how do the RFP points work? When there's a request for proposal for funding, um, the state agency is allowed to say, uh, who are we going to fund? And how do we decide who to fund? And what we do is we, we assign point values to various characteristics of applications. And so we can use that as a tool uh, to direct our funding in a, in a more fair or smart way or to achieve different um, policy objectives. So that's what we meant by talking about RFP points. Um, there was another question about um, will the NAFC be accepted into the registry? And at NAFC, the um, accrediting body for family child care centers that's similar to the NIAC accreditation for, for family child care centers uh, is currently accepted into the registry. We are doing a crosswalk currently um, to uh, connect it also to the QRIS um, going forward in, in the future. Um, there was a question about um, uh, currently, the ASQ that's used for screening for developmental delays doesn't provide feedback to child care providers, only to parents and pediatricians. And so that's a barrier to um, its usefulness to the field and also to, to sending into the AS, ASQ. And so um, that's a great uh, point. And I, I'm not sure that Dave, uh, Commissioner Wilkinson had gone into much detail, but we are pursuing um, an, a more robust strategy for screening for developmental delays that he's going to speak. So I think that is a terrific point, uh, and we are looking at piloting. Um, and one thing I mentioned before, but wasn't as specific on in terms of providers, was who are piloting a new app. That app, we're hopeful, 
uh, and we're hearing you loud and clear, but we're hopeful uh, will be more meaningfully useful uh, for um, child care providers themselves. So you can, for instance, if a child, let's say, has a motor delay, the A, you know about it, uh, it with, of course, the parent's permission uh, to know about it, and uh, that you can do something about it by providing you, teeing up easy tools and, th and activities you can do with the child. So I'll give you back to Mary. So there's another question about school readiness funding, and what does that have to do with uh, private providers? How does that impact private providers? Um, and some other questions about that. So school readiness is a kind of funding that the um, is, in, is written into legislation that the agency is allowed to distribute to specific towns throughout Connecticut um, to provide sort of funded slots that are awarded to programs themselves. Um, so it's not available in every town. Um, uh, the reason that there's focus on this plan in, uh, for proposing legislative changes is the current rate is set at a capped level for providers, a per child rate. Um, and so we're seeking the ability to be able to set that rate ourselves over time. Um, What's important to note about this and why that's called out and not other things is when we did the landscape assessment about what, what can we do, what requires legislation and we need to act on quickly for this legislative session and what can we do administratively, uh, school readiness funding levels um, or slot rate um, amounts uh, was one of the few areas that actually required legislative approval and we have a lot of other tools, for example, increasing care for kids rates or CDC rates that aren't um, hemmed in by legislation in the same way. Um, school readiness is a $90 million um, program, which is our second biggest um, uh, program as well. So it's, it's a big piece of the pie that we want to make sure functions well. Um, is there a plan B for the bill? So I guess the plan B is we have a lot of other tools in our toolbox. This isn't if, if these bills don't move forward. Um, we are we, we are bound by legislation and we'll try again in the future, but it doesn't mean we're, we won't we will continue to pursue all the things we can without a legislative solution. Um, so, and this is Dave, I would just say it's important that they do pass. Um, this uh, is critical to the, the strategy that many of you have invested time in, that we have invested time in, and more importantly for families, for infants, toddlers, children, children with um, facing particular challenges, and to create a more streamlined system. So we just think it's very important that this, um, that they do pass. Uh, and I'll give you back to Mary. So there, uh, very quickly, there were a couple of questions about the sliding fee scale that's um, implemented as part of our school readiness and child day care programs, which is the amount that families are expected to pay, which doesn't align with our care for kids sliding fee scale. So our care for kids sliding fee scale um, has an increasing percentage of income that's required as your income goes up. For school readiness and CDCs, the higher your income gets, the smaller the percentage of your income is charged to those families. And so there was questions about, um, are we going to adjust? that to make it a, a more fair system. So that's a perfect example of the type of thing when we say we're looking into how we administer our funds into our RFPs, into our grants and contracts throughout these things, that's exactly the type of um, uh, specific detail that we will have the ability to change um, during this process. And thanks for bringing that up. Um, there was another question about the uh, same thing with um, the quality dollars or administrative dollars. Um, those are all things, depending on the funding stream, that um, can be adjusted. Um, uh, as we as we take a thorough look at the way we um, get money out to the field. Um, for the fees for the background checks, which recently increased to $87, was a question about um, that versus the background check system. So the fee that increased for background checks um, was uh, due to the f fact that we as a field, uh, early care and education, had been given a waiver by the state police that waived the full cost of that fee. That waiver has been rescinded, and so the state police now charge the full amount to the field, which we um, don't have the ability to control on our side. What we, what we can control and what we're proposing to do is um, there's been a, a concern that when a, a provider submits background check information, sometimes you may not hear for months um, 
what the result is, and it may be because of an error, or it may be because um, everything is fine. Uh, and so this will provide providers with um, the ability to see the process of the background check and be able to have certainty about the results for the staff that they've employed. Um, and then finally, there was a question, a question about how to be in a work group. And again, we'll be sending out detailed survey um, after this webinar. And one of the questions is, what work groups would you like to be a part of? And so we'll be sure to capture all suggestions. Christine, um, I think we'll pass it over to you for the final section. Okay, great. Um, so this final section, the final action area is communication, information, and collaboration. And I think um, from, from the point of view of class where I work, this is one of the most important areas because all of our work, um, all of the work that we do on programs that serve children and families should be informed by the experiences of, of families and the people who serve them directly. Um, and so this, I think, is really critical in, in addressing all kinds of issues. Um, the pain points that stakeholders identified in this area is that family voice is not driving decisions um, and that there is a need for continuous feedback loops between OEC and providers, advocates, and other stakeholders. So communication, communication, communication. Um, to, the evidence of that is that there's a lack of infrastructure for OEC to routinely solicit feedback from parents on policy decisions and that OEC's website is difficult to navigate. So to the extent that either parents or providers are seeking information on, on the website, um, it, it's not set up in a way or designed in a way that, um, that they can easily find what they're looking for whether they're a parent who's looking for how to apply for a child care, for child care assistance or whether it's a provider who's looking for information about, um, a, about any number of things, professional development or, or any other topic. Um, so those are, this, is the, um, this is the area around hearing the voices of impacted families and providers and integrating that into policy decisions. Um, so to hear how OEC is going to move forward in doing that, I'll just turn it back over to the Commissioner. Great. Thank you so much, Christine, and thanks again for all your support uh, through this uh, whole process. Um, and this last issue area, we've got 10 minutes. We'll go quickly. Um, if folks can stay on longer, we'll stay on longer to answer some questions, uh, but we're grateful for everyone's time and, and commitment to, to hearing the actions we're taking. Um, so the first challenge uh, in this action area um, is that family voice is not driving decisions, as Christine mentioned. Our high-level objective, objective is to build the infrastructure for direct relationships with and channels for families to get the information they need and uh, to pr for them to provide meaningful feedback to the system, very aligned with our family first, two-gen, multi-generational mission. Uh, is parental feedback is really at the core, um, being able to listen and respond. So our proposed actions are to create better resources to communicate with families on program availability, safety and quality, and eligibility requirements. Uh, and so uh, our next steps are to implement feedback loops with parents through better communications, family surveys, community meetings, webinars, community liaisons, child care 211, QRIS uh, ratings, et cetera. Better feedback loops with parents. Um, uh, and, and we know there's great leaders um, in the state who are working on that and who we can be supporting to help us do that better. Um, two is uh, conduct uh, a family survey on the impact of the Care for Kids closure wait list. We need to know what happens. Um, and what choices families make when we shut off a program like Care for Kids, because that influences uh, policies. Uh, we need to understand what happens to providers. We need to understand what happens to families. Uh, do they work fewer hours and decrease family income? Uh, what's the resulting impact on subsidies that they may need from the state? Uh, do they make the tough decision to use um, uh, care uh, that is not regulated but may be uh, cheaper, um, and what, is, what are the safety implications there. So we're going to do that survey uh, so the world knows. Uh, the next uh, 
area where we already have activity going on is to rebuild the OEC website uh, to be more user friendly. Um, and uh, we also recognize that the best people uh, to tell us how to best support parents are parents themselves. Uh, so I'm really excited to announce that we will be creating an Office of Early Childhood Parent Cabinet uh, to advise OEC on agency decisions and policies. Uh, the next uh, proposed uh, action area uh, is, uh, or action area is to uh, ensure racially and culturally diverse representation from communities, families, and from providers uh, in discussions around early care education policies. Uh, we'll do so through intentional outreach and inclusion. Uh, first and foremost, I just named a series of activities that we are undertaking, and we're going to ensure uh, that the, the new family voice action items above are acted on uh, with a racial equity lens. Uh, this has to do with providers as well, and we need to be very intentional about bringing um, a diverse group of providers that represent represent the actual diversity of our uh, provider community, uh, um, to have them all at the table uh, as we uh, talk about uh, uh, any policies and systems changes within ECE. The next area that's already underway uh, is development of new uh, community level partnerships with racially, culturally, and linguistically diverse organizations. Um, and that's already underway, uh, and more to come on that. And then uh, thirdly uh, is to conduct racial equity impact assessments of, in a, of our proposed policies. Uh, and so that is something that we will be doing uh, going forward. Okay, so now on to the, so we're very enthusiastic about all of those steps. Uh, and um, and uh, our last slide uh, of the entire presentation uh, is um, to address the need for continuous feedback loops between the Office of Early Childhood and providers, advocates, and other stakeholders. And so our high-level objective is to build an infrastructure for transparent communications that lead to collaborative direction setting. Um, so two types of actions here that are very uh, kind of distinct. Uh, one is to empower stakeholders with compelling information about the impact of early care and education programs and the value of early childhood investments to better tell, uh, so that you can better tell your story. Uh, so we know that, that we have tools at our disposal in terms of data and otherwise uh, to better and more precisely show the impact of ECE investments. Uh, that's the impact of the Office of Early Childhood and its programs. And it's really the impact uh, that providers are having on the ground. Um, this isn't more reporting on the behalf of providers, but more linking that administrative data. Because um, we know that providers, or child care providers' work are doing things like increasing kindergarten readiness. They're saving state and school districts money by reducing special ed requirements. Uh, we know that there's a strong correlation between high quality child care and reducing child welfare system engagement. Um, uh, and of course, the connection between child care and parental employment and reduced need for other subsidies. Uh, not to mention, of course, uh, what we will also be focusing more on the longer term success benchmarks, uh, like for instance, high school graduation and long term employment and life success. Uh, but these things are important. Providers and advocates, the people on this phone, need to be empowered with this type of information so you can more compellingly uh, make the case. Legislators need to hear this information so they know that what they're allocating uh, to early childhood programming um, is achieving what they hoped it would. Uh, and so it's so important that we do that. So we'll be defining, already underway, defining shared meaningful family outcomes that are based on shared goals um, of the Office of Early Childhood, of providers, advocates, families, and other stakeholders. Stakeholders. Uh, we're going to translate those outcomes into measurable metrics that can be tied to existing administrative data sets at the state level um, and shared publicly. Um, we know that a lot of what we do is preventive. Um, and in doing preventive activities that set children on great uh, futures to be future learners, um, we're also, uh, in addition to those great positive human outcomes we're achieving, we're achieving savings for the state uh, by avoiding uh, uh, greater impact on safety net systems. 
And so we will also then finally communicate the progress early care and education providers are making towards the achievement of family outcomes and reinforcing the value of early childhood investments. And this will also help us to learn and course correct and continually improve. So we're excited about that as well. Uh, the final action area um, is uh, to continually seek feedback from providers and advocates on how OEC is doing and what we can do to improve and to better serve you. Uh, and so for us, that's to better, uh, uh, is to deliver a progress report. Uh, a lot of these have to do actually with this very action. We hope we, you see uh, that this, these action sessions and this action plan marks a a very distinctive approach to doing business for a state agency, one that deeply involved you uh, from the very beginning and that will continue uh, to involve you and uh, uh, your priorities. Ultimately, many of you, those of you who are providers on this call, you're on the front lines and we need to listen to you first and foremost. And, that, and we're also accountable to you and we want to show we're, we're accountable to you uh, by, for instance, uh, delivering progress reports on these actions that we just talked about at every child, early childhood cabinet, would happen, which happen quarterly, and a follow-on uh, uh, webinar that goes more in depth. So we did a one-hour presentation on Friday of last week. We do a two-hour presentation to you, and we will commit to doing that uh, quarterly. Uh, uh, not to say that's your only opportunity to hear from us. You can jump in um, whenever and give us feedback. We'll also build a public report card uh, on progress, uh, on the progress of this action plan. Uh, and we will share the sequence. As I mentioned, we cannot do all of these things at once or we won't um, uh, be able to do any of them. So we need to pick the sequence. Uh, for instance, it was obvious that the legislative session was upon us, so we need to take legislative action immediately. Um, but we will be public about the sequence and the planned timing of these actions uh, so, that, so that you see that, that you understand, hey, the area that I really care about, um, you have line of sight to when, or that you really care about, you have line of sight to when it gets taken on. And then you can give feedback, say, hey, move this up. And we want to hear that too. Um, the next area that's uh, beginning to be underway is having a transparent process for work group formation. Mary already discussed that. Um, and then both within and beyond this is to implement more regular feedback loops through better communication surveys, community meetings, webinars, community liaisons, and other activities. Um, and so we are uh, so grateful uh, to you. Um, that our advocacy, uh, policy, and provider community and parent community, those of you who are on the call today, um, this webinar is also recorded so that it can be accessed at any time in the future uh, for folks who may not have been on the call or for anyone who wants to go back and, and say, what did they say about that particular thing? Uh, so we'll have that. That will stay on the record uh, for you. Um, we're here uh, to help many of you, uh, if not all of you, better serve children and families. We take that responsibility very seriously. Uh, as I said, we want to be radically transparent and responsive, uh, and uh, we hope you see that um, in the action plan uh, that we are presenting to you today. Uh, so we are right on the hour. Again, um, I will just pop forward to the next slide just so everyone knows, and then we'll answer any questions for folks who are able to uh, stay online. So you may be wondering about next steps. Uh, obviously, we've identified a lot of policy next steps, um, but next steps in terms of, of this action process um, is uh, a w uh, we've done the webinar, uh, and so we'll be doing a survey, um, and uh, then we will be I more clearly identifying for our, all of our stakeholders, the um, implementation sequence and uh, working, of course, actively on the implementation of these items, and then we're going to do ongoing uh, reporting both to the Early Childhood Cabinet and, of course, to you. And finally, I just want to thank all of our partners who made this possible. It was really important that this uh, be an independent process and people feel like they could speak truth to power, uh, and so uh, having independ this in independently funded by the Connecticut Early Childhood Funder Collaborative, uh, then bringing on CLASP and Christine Johnson. And Staub uh, and others uh, at the organization Third Sector um, that helped us build this through a federal grant, uh, and of course the United Way of Southeastern Connecticut, the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, the Fairfield Community Foundation, and the Connecticut Community Foundation uh, for uh, their ability to help us bring together an independent process here. It was, it's 
so uh, we're so grateful for that. And mostly we're grateful to you, all the providers and advocates who uh, work for children every day. Uh, so with that, thank you very much. And we will answer any questions for those who can stick on, um, uh, any questions that popped up during this last uh, action area of communications, information, and collaboration. Mary. Sure. Thanks, Steve. Commissioner Wilkinson, sorry. Um, so there is a question about um, communication. So the, uh, the providers had previously received snail mail notification, um, and now in the shift to other types of communication that there uh, have been gaps in communication, and could there be more consistent email updates potentially, or, or even potentially going back to snail mail? Um, thank you for letting us know about that gap. We'll certainly um, look into that as we as we build our communications infrastructure better. Um, there's questions about the slides. Are they going to be available? As Dave said, this, uh, we'll send out the slides. We'll send out the webinar. I will also be posted on our website, um, and we'll try and push, push it out as, as uh, broadly as we can. Um, there was a question about Bill 5449, about the school readiness rate um, cap. Uh, the, uh, being taken off, and could there be a hold harmless clause that the rate won't be less than the year before? I believe that that intent that the rate changes are to increase quality um, are written into the bill itself, but that's certainly feedback you could give to your legislator if you'd like to see that change made. Um, there was a question about um, uh, some specifics about uh, uh, um, CPR and first aid being offered more broad, more widely available statewide, in particular on Saturdays. Um, I will certainly pass that along to our team who are um, implementing those uh, that access to those supports to, to staff. And then there was a question about um, adding back the regulations to to box plus 12. Which, if you've written in that question, uh, I, I wasn't totally clear on that. So try and follow up with us into it. Oh, bachelors plus 12. Thank you, Dave. It's um, interpreting. Um, so please do write to us directly with your full question, and we'll try and answer it offline. Um, I believe that that was um, the last question. Thank you all so much for carving out time. Um, and uh, we look forward to many continued future conversations about building a system together. Thank you.